Hello, this is Edith Niemeyer, and I'm the author of the book, The Mystery of Adam. I want to, uh, today, just talk some more about this Melchizedek. I already talked a little bit about it, but I did some more research, and I really uh, came to the conclusion that I should say a little bit more, because Melchizedek, this story about Melchizedek is very intriguing, and uh, just really shrouded with mystery in a sense. And so I did some research and I came across a guy called the Vigilant Texan on the YouTube, um, and that's his name on YouTube, Vigilant Texan. And he did a video called The Order of Melchizedek, and he did a really great research um, on Melchizedek and um, discovered things that were just really, really interesting. Now, this Melchizedek, I have already said in one of my videos, um, is that Melchizedek that Abraham met um, after he um, rescued his brother Lot from these kings. And so it's called the Wars of the king, with the Kings. And uh, he met Melchizedek. Of course, who was what? King of Salem and high priest. And we hear in in um, Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, that Christ, Jesus, or the Messiah, Mashiach, is a king according to the order of Melchizedek. And I believe that is in Psalms 110 also that there was uh, something said about that. Um, I can find it. Kings Chronicles Oh, I can't find it. Um, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. We got it. One hundred and ten. I can find it. Four nineteen. This is the nine one hundred and ten. Here it is. Uh, it is one hundred and ten, verse four. The Lord was sworn, and will not change His mind. Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And then it comes, the Lord is at thy right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations, and he will fill them with corpses, and he will shatter the chief men over a broad country, and so on. This is talking about, of course, uh, Messiah's return. Okay, so this is what he's saying: the Lord has sworn, and He will not change His mind. Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so, that was the second time that Scripture of the Old Testament talks about Melchizedek. So the first time Melchizedek was brought up uh, with um, Abraham. And then a thousand years later, in Psalm 110, he brings it up again, Melchizedek. And then, of course, another thousand years later, that's when um, Jesus, the Messiah, was born according to the order of Melchizedek. And now um, the writer of Hebrew picks it up. And in 
Hebrews 7, the writer says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham at, as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings, blessed him. To whom also Abraham uh, apportioned a tenth part of all the spoil. Um, was first of all by the translation of his name King of Righteousness and then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace. Okay. So, um, this is again talking about the, the actual king. Okay. And then, um, of course, it goes into that Jesus Christ became our high priest. You continue reading, you know, in Hebrews, that Jesus Christ himself was um, that fulfillment of the king uh, of the Melchizedek, who was the king um, of Salem and a high priest of God. Now, this. Um, person that did this video, this vigilant Texan, as he calls himself, um, he traces back this kingship further than um, the king of Salem, that Abraham. Now, I said uh, in my previous videos that, that the king of Salem, or Melchizedek, was um, Shem. And we know that because when we read um, Cheshire, and Cheshire is a really great, I call it a history book, okay? It, because it parallels Genesis. And it tells us in more detail what happened um, in Genesis. Genesis is very short, condensed, and Cheshire is a little more into detail. And, and I, this is my book of Cheshire, um, and it's more in detail. And um, the Jews use Chasher um, and the Book of Jubilee alongside um, all the other books, in, you know, of um, the Old Testament. So it was widely used, and it was even quoted in um, one of the the letters. I don't remember which one, but one of the letters to one of them actually um, referred to Cheshire, that it was written in Cheshire. So Cheshire was widely used by the Jews uh, before Jesus' time, during Jesus' time, and before Jesus' time um, as one of the books, um, one of the historical books, actually, just like the Kings and the Chronicles. Uh, uh, Cheshire was a historical book. Now, Torah is their main, main book, okay? But Torah is pretty condensed. And so again, this Cheshire and the Book of Jubilee are kind of um, an addition, gives you more information. And so when we look at the Book of Cheshire, we can read that it was actually Shem that was this Melchizedek. Some people get very um, confused when they read um, Hebrews, because in Hebrews, it says that this um, Melchizedek didn't have uh, no father or mother. Um, and uh, so people get kind of a little confused there. And um, I think the reason this story with Melchizedek is, is really kind of a mystery. Because we had um, these priests slash king um, people according to the order of Melchizedek. However, they were only, I think, uh, types of the true Melchizedek that would eventually come, which was Christ. So they were carrying on the, the torch, so to, see, so to say, from the beginning of, um, of Adam. 
all the way through history until the true Melchizedek would come, which is, of course, Jesus Christ, Messiah. Okay, because only Messiah is the true, can only be the true high priest that stands between us and and God, and the high priest that is the only one who can offer sacrifices for us. Nobody in between, no man can really um, offer sacrifices uh, for us in the long run. Only Jesus could do that. So these people in between were interim high priests and kings. And Shem was in that line of high priests that came out of um, Adam. Okay, we can, when we look, uh, read the genealogy of um, the, 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 um, the uh, people of Adam that came out of Adam, then we can see the lineage that goes straight back from Noah to, to Adam. And all the people that are mentioned are carriers of this priesthood. Uh, you know, there is Adam, and then there's Seth, um, and um, then there is, one of them is Enoch, uh, eventually down the road, Lamech, um, then there is Methuselah, um, and then, of course, eventually then there is Noah, and Noah was the only one who survived the flood because he was the only just one. And of course, he had three sons. And Noah gave this um, lineage to his son Shem. Okay. And Shem, of course, passed it on eventually to Abraham. Okay. Because Abraham came out of that lineage of, um, of Shem. And you can also read that much better in Shashua, in Shasher, the book of Shasher. You can see the lineage much better than in, in um, Genesis. I mean, it comes out, but I love to read the genealogy in Shasher because it's so much clearer. Um, and you can read the different sons of Shem. Um, uh, there is, uh, and I don't remember them all, uh, there is... Uh, Aber, um, and I, I hope I say it rightly. Uh, there's Aber, there is Ru, um, and there's Pelic. So there's a whole bunch, uh, you know, of sons until they you get to to Abraham, and of course Abraham's father was um, Terah, and the one before that was Nahor. And so if you go back, you know, you end up with Shem. So Abraham was in that lineage of Shem. So this priesthood and the king of Salem was kind of also moved on to these through these generations. We know that Abraham, and I again know that from Cheshire, that Abraham studied when he was 10 years old, he was taken to his Great grand great 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 grand grandfather, um, Aber and uh, and Shem to learn about God. And that's where he learned about God. And that's why he could go back to his father and say, "Hey, you have idols, get them out of here." Okay, because he learned it. And then Isaac was sent to Aber and to um, Shem to learn about God. And then Ishmael went. And then Jacob went. Okay. Now, when we get to Jacob, um, he went and, and actually studied with Eber and Shem for a long, long, long time. I think I even he even stayed there until Shem died. Um, so, because Shem was quite old, 600 years. Um, I don't remember. I have, I have it here. If I can find it, I could, but. I didn't see it right now. So, but Shem got pretty, pretty, um, got very old. Okay, 
Shimon Eber were even there when um, Sarah died. Um, when uh, Isaac was born. So it, it's just um, interesting to read these this genealogy in, in Cheshire. So all these genealogies go back and they were all priests according to the order of Melchizedek. Now Ishmael didn't go, neither did Esau. Esau did not want to go. And I believe that's why God did not choose him is because Ishmael, I mean, uh, Esau did not want to have anything to do with God. Okay, so that's why. And this um, vigilant Texan brought out the fact that these um, kings slash high priests, they were chosen not because of really the uh, biological in it, but because of their um, belief or faith in in God, in the true God, in the in the Creator. Okay, you could be in the lineage, but you had to also believe, and that's how you were chosen um, by God to continue this priesthood. So it was a priesthood of faith, which we see in Jacob, and not Jacob, but um, Isaac. Isaac is a son of the five faith, okay? And we know that only the sons by faith are the ones that are Abraham's seed. We see the same thing with um, Jacob. Jacob was called Israel. He was the father of faith, okay? He followed the footsteps of Abraham and thus became, again, this high priest uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so then when we get to Israel, it gets kind of muddled because Israel had 12 sons, of course. And I said that before. And of course, only one of them had the promise to bring Messiah into this world. Not every one of the tribes of um, Israel had that promise, only one tribe, and that was Judah. So during Israel's time, we don't read very much. I'm, I'm still doing some research on that, um, how this happened that the Levites all of a sudden became um, the priests, okay, the priests. I don't know how that happened. And nothing is said that um, only specific people would be the high priest, but all of the uh, sons of Levi, all the descendants of Levi could be priests, regardless of what they believe. Okay, there were many priests that, that just were not very good. Uh, when we, for instance, um, well, I, I can't come up with anybody's name. But there were a lot of them that were not very good. And they still could become priests. So this priesthood became pretty corrupt. Or could become very corrupt. Because remember in those days, they didn't have uh, the Holy Spirit as well. And so it was easy, easy to become corrupt. Um, but yet, under uh, these 12 tribes, only the Levites can become priests. I don't know how it happened, but if you know it, hey, put it on the bottom. It would be really interesting to find out. So yes, again, you can search in um, in Hebrews about uh, this 
um, Melchizedek, which I think is just really, again, remarkable and shrouded with mystery. So I was talking about this Melchizedek. So how does this Melchizedek, this order, you know, continue? I mean, there were none, none in between um, that were true um, in the lineage of Melchizedek. I guess not. Because maybe what God did with the um, 12 tribes of Israel is maybe he just created a special, uh, a special, a special people in order to protect for this true Melchizedek to come through. Okay, because all this time we don't hear anything about Melchizedek, and then all of a sudden here we are again, that the true Mel Melchizedek was born. You know, to almost two thousand. Well, we we see a thousand years after he was even mentioned. But it was 2,000 years, really, after um, after Abraham, okay? So Abraham still being maybe this type of Melchizedek, and then we don't hear anything for 2,000 years, which is exactly the time of the Jews, and maybe an interim covenant um, that God made to bring forth the true Melchizedek. I'm just throwing it out there. But anyways, listen to this guy. That's why I'm doing this video. I just really want you to go to this guy and I put the information below. Uh, it's called uh, The Order of Melchizedek, the Vigilant Texan. Okay, there's another one that I'm going to bring up next time with this Vigilant Texan, he did some research on the um, the the marriage ceremony, the, the traditional Jewish marriage ceremony. And so I'm gonna bring it up next time. But anyways, I, I just really recommend the book of Chasher and the book of Chuli. I read this afternoon in Chasher a little bit more, and I may just also do some research with the book of Chuli because I really want to get. If I, I just really need to see more about um, um, Israel. Israel is a very intriguing um, thing too, a very uh, something that's shrouded with mystery, because we talk so much about Israel, right? Today we have Israel, um, and which was given to the the land um, of the Jews today, which is called Israel. But it is so confusing for me because in reality, um, it is not the land of the 12 tribes because most of those tribes are really lost, okay? I have already said that the, uh, the Northern Kingdom, so which contained most of the 12 tribes, they lost. They lost. They went into captivity. They came never back. They never came back. And God, for sure, in Jeremiah, divorced them. So they they don't inherit anything. They are divorced. Okay, that's it. The only uh, the only hope they have is really again come under this. Um, promise that God made with Abraham through this Melchizedek, okay? Not through the Mount Sinai uh, covenant. That Mount Sinai covenant, they did not fulfill. Because they didn't fulfill it, they're no longer under that contract. But God promised to Abraham that a seed of his, his seed, right, will um, be the promise of, of all nations. And that seed, of course, is that true Melchizedek. And 
So it is today a little confused when we talk about Israel because it is not Israel. The people that now are back, even now are back in the promised land or in, yeah, let's say the promised land. That's what we call the promised land. Israel are again the Benjaminites and the, in the tribe of Judah. So the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin because they were the only ones returning after the Babylonian captivity. Even though I also believe that they were divorced and there is no more contract, Sinai contract uh, with them. That contract is null and void. Just like um, the contract with the other tribes was null and void. God brought them back because they still had to bring forth Messiah or the true Melchizedek. And that's the only reason why they came back. So again, even the people now, the, two, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, they can only be God's people, again, through the covenant or the promise that was made to Abraham. And again, through the true uh, Melchizedek. Um, and not through the old covenant at, at Mount Sinai with the old um, Levites. That's gone. Uh, I know the Jews don't want to see that, but it's just the way it is. Okay. And again, Messiah comes through Judah. That's for sure. However, I talked about the bride of Mashiach. We all can become the bride of Mashiach. All of us, okay, Jews and Gentiles, and they are all called the true Israel. They are all the descendants, really, of Israel, the spiritual descendant of Israel, the ones that will accept the promise God has made to Abraham, Jacob, and of course, uh, I mean, same thing, Israel, right? Isaac and Jacob. And that Jacob, they, uh, Jacob knew that that promise was, of course, Messiah. And so now we have um, access to God through this Melchizedek. Um, and we are all the bride of Christ. And I, I know it is, it's very confusing because we don't talk about it. Uh, we don't talk about it as Christians very much. We don't talk it even, I, I don't hear that, the uh, the Jews preaching either. So we always hear Israel, Israel, Israel. And, and I will do one about Israel because for me that is still extremely confusing. And it's confusing because we are hearing the wrong things. And I, I think because, especially because we hear that word, well, we should protect Israel, we should bless Israel and all these things. And we are saying, or they're telling us, well, this Israel is the state of Israel. And and I don't believe that. The state of Israel is a secular state. Um, it is not the state that God has in mind with Israel. Okay? Spiritual Israel is something totally different. Spiritual Israel is the bride of Christ, and we all can belong to that bride of Christ, Jews and Gentiles. And then, of course, yes, this Melchizedek had to come through only the tribe of Judah. And not all 12 tribes, only the tribe of Judah. And that Melchizedek will be the king over the true Israel. Okay, he will be the king of true Israel, which is, um, yes, Salem. But again, if we see it spiritually, it's not the true Jerusalem that we find in Jerusalem. I went to Jerusalem. I went to Israel about three years ago. And I was disappointed. I was very disappointed. I said that already on one of my videos. Um, because you either have these um, Hasidic Jews, let's call them Hasidic Jews, or these 
orthodox Jews or you have the uh, the secular Jews that don't even believe in anything. And um, for me, it was very disappointing because there were there's there are more secular Jews than actually believing Jews, and the Jews that believe um, they believe really not in 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 um, Torah. They believe in Talmud. And I have listened to many um, Jews right now that are confirming that, that the Orthodox Jews, their rabbis, they don't learn, they don't read um, uh, Torah. They read Talmud. Matter of fact, they are not even supposed to read um, Torah because they're saying, oh, no, no, you can't read Torah by yourself because you don't know how to interpret it, okay? You need to have these rabbis in the Talmud that explain to you what Torah is saying. So they do not even read Torah, okay? And then they want to say, and they want to understand who their Messiah is. And they will never know. I will finish up today, because I know um, this can just go on and on. But, I'm challenging you to listen to this vigilant Texan and because he did a re I mean a great research and I don't have to reha rehash what he said, but he did some really great, great study. And so I want to continue uh, studying this uh, Melchizedek um, person, whatever it is, right? I am going to, I have started reading my Hebrew, my Hebrew, the letter to Hebrews. And I love it. I, I read it last night and I love the letter to Hebrew. Uh, one thing I want to just add real fast. He, um, there's people, this vigilant Texan, he believed that Apollos wrote um, the letter to the Hebrews. And I still believe it. It was Philip. Um, I don't think it was Paul, not at all. And the reason for that is, there's a really good reason. When the canon was put together, and I believe it was Jerome who put the canon together, um, he put the orders of Paul's letters by the greatest to the smallest, okay? And so when you look at Hebrews, you can see that Hebrews is not one of Paul's uh, letters according to the guy that put the canon together, which was Jerome, and I'm thinking around 300, okay, within the 300 uh, range of the years, 300. So during that time, he already knew that Hebrews was not a book of um, Paul, but it must have been of somebody else, like, for instance, um, Apollos or somebody else. And this Texan guy, he thought it was Apollos. I believe it was Priscilla. I really do. Maybe I just want to believe it. But I do believe it. Um, wonderfully, wonderfully read. I mean, very smart. The person that wrote that book. Very smart. Knew the, the scripture, the Old Testament very well. Um, so, I just want to add that. And I'm going to finish up right now. And I will talk to you next time more about the temple and uh, the bride of Messiah, Mashiach.